well, my, my son is going to go to college this year and I'm concerned. I'm not worried. Worried is, is sin, but I'm concerned. <coughs> One second, something just went up. <coughs> Somebody gave me a mint that lodged in my throat. I should be more concerned about that. Wait a minute. <coughs> okay, I'm concerned for three things. I'm not concerned about where he's going to school not concerned he's going out of state. I'm not concerned about the load of classwork. And I'm not even concerned he's going to play football with bigger and stronger and faster guys that will knock his head in. That's good for him. I'm not concerned about that. I am concerned about one thing, though. Dormitory living. Dormitory living scares me because I lived in it. In 1984, I was a freshman in college. I lived in an all-guys dorm, and all of these... Kids from all over the country came and were, it was like a prison house. You know, they all came to live in a college and they lived on, in my dorm there were 10 floors with probably 20 guys on a floor. It was, it was a madhouse. It's crazy. I can remember, oh, the first thing I remember is nobody would turn off their radios. They'd be on until 2, 3, 4 o'clock at night sometimes. And you know, you try to sleep and you'd just be hearing Van Halen through the hallways, you know. The Highway to Hell, that's a, you know, that's a really good, good song to sleep on, you know? Or we had, um, we had a lot of drunks. They would sneak in beer and girls, and they weren't allowed to, but at our school, for some reason, they didn't. I mean, we had a lot of drunks. There were a lot of drunks there. And the third thing was we had a lot of, um, well, we had some thieves that would, if the doors were open, they'd come in. I remember coming back to my room one time, and out in the, out in the front of the dorm, they're playing football, and that's my football. Hey, where'd you guys get that football? Well, we don't know what you're talking about. Just found it. But there were pranksters. Pranksters were the worst. The first service, I said there was pranksters, and Jared Doty kind of went like that. And I said, Jared, you weren't a prankster, were you? Jared wouldn't be a prankster. He's still pranking us as a pastor. Here's some of the pranks I remember when I was in uh, college. Some kids would go to the lobby and get the room key to your room, and they'd go into your room, and they'd rearrange the furniture and duct tape everything. It'd drive me crazy. Actually, I, I was thinking about it between services. My brother-in-law went to Ohio State University. If you ever watch, like, football in Ohio State's on, you should do that. There's these giant dorms. They look like corn cob stalks. And he lived on the second highest floor. There's 25 floors. And uh, his roommates and him decided to plug up all of the um, drains in the men's bathroom. And they flooded everything so they could have a hot tub. And the water got up about four feet high. They, duct they also duct taped all the seams on the doors. The waters got up to four feet high and it got so heavy, it broke the floor and it went all the way down. And they kind of got in trouble. That kind of pranking's not good. But this, this one kid, this one kid in my dorm learned how to, it's called pennying a door, where you take pennies and you shove pennies in the, the door creases, you know, and you shove them all in there, and then when somebody's on the inside, they're locked in. You can't open the door because all the pennies are pushing the door and it's impossible to open the door. And I'll never forget when our RA was pennied in there, he couldn't get out. Banging on the door, Help! And nobody, everybody ignored him so he could blast Highway to Hell until 5 in the morning. You know, I mean, it's that kind of... A... But I've always, I never wanted to be an RA. I remember they asked me to be an RA. Here's what an RA is. An RA is the guy that lives at the end of the hall. R stands for resident assistant. And a resident assistant is a student, usually an upperclassman, who gets money off of his bill to keep everybody in line on that floor. It's called an RA. It's a resident assistant. The problem with being an RA is you're living, you're living in between two worlds. You're a student, but the students don't like you. And you are working for the university, but you still want to be a student, and you kind of want to fudge the rules. And so you're living in this weird middle world called the life of an RA. Believe it or not, if you're a Christian, you are an RA. We're going to learn about you are also stuck in between worlds. You're in the middle of this world. You are somewhat like people who are living on this earth, but really you belong to another place. 
And today we're going to talk about what does it mean to be an RA and how do you live as an RA on becoming an RA. And we're going to learn it from the life of Abraham. So if you can turn to Genesis 23. We're going to read the story of the death of Sarah. But we're going to learn more about what it means to be an RA. I'll read a few of the verses. Genesis 23, verse 1. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. So she lived a good long time. She died in Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Verse 3, Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and he spoke to the Hittites. Because the Hittites lived in the land. It's a group of people that dwelled, they set up residence in the southern part of Israel where Abraham was sojourning. Or what that means is he was wandering and every once in a while setting up residence. He said to the Hittites, I'm an alien and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. Verse 5, the Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You're a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. He said to them, If you're willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf, so he'll sell me the cave of Machpelah, which belongs to him and is at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it. So he went to Ephron. They struck up a deal. Verse 14, Ephron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my lord, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver, but what is that between me and you? Bury your dead. So you can buy my land. Go ahead and bury him. So Ephron's field in Machpelah and there, Mamre, both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field was deeded to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is in Hebron in the land of Canaan. So the field... And the cave in it were deeded to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. So in a way, here's the story. Might not be too exciting to most, but the story is about a death. It's about a tomb and buying the plot of land to bury the person in the tomb. Sarah, we find, is 127 years old. She lived a long life. She had a lot of life with Abraham. They moved from Ur. Remember, Sarah was the one that was so beautiful that Pharaoh wanted to take her as his wife. Same one that Abimelech wanted to take her as his wife. Had uh, Isaac, because she laughed, named him laughter. She had quite a life. Well, she died, and Abraham wanted a place to bury her. And we're going to learn he wanted to bury her specifically in the promised land. He found a nice piece of land. And uh, that nice piece of land was owned by Ephron the Hittite. Large area, had a cave. It had a lot of trees. You can imagine it had like flowing hills, a nice place, place to, quiet place to bury those you love. This is in the city of Hebron. Today, Hebron is still there. The modern day city of Hebron still brags that it has the tomb of the patriarchs. Because in this tomb... According to Scripture, was buried Sarah and Abraham, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah. Some Jewish Orthodox believers think Adam and Eve might even be buried there. Some will even say um, the story of Esau selling his birthrights was really Esau sold his rights to be buried there, which Jacob bought. I don't know if that's true, but it's just speculation. This uh, tomb of the patriarchs today in Hebron is one of the most important Jewish sites to go because that's where Abraham's buried, the father of their faith. Abraham's also the father of the Islamic faith. And the uh, Muslims have put a mosque over top of it. So if a Jew wants to go worship there, he's got to get permission from the Islamic authorities in that region to go worship there. And so you can imagine to this day It is literally one of the most volatile places in all the land of Israel. Actually, this is where the biggest Palestinian-Israeli conflicts take place. In 1929, 
Jews started coming to settle in Israel. And they, a small contingent went into Hebron and they were not wanted, but they settled in there because they were hardy. To this day, there's about 100,000 Muslims and 2,000 Jews, Orthodox Jews. Around 1929, um, some Orthodox Jews went in to worship and I think about 35 were slaughtered by Muslims. And then for retaliation, another 20 years, they slaughtered some Muslims worshiping there. A couple of years ago, more Jews were slaughtered there. And there's a lot of blood that has been spilt as people go to worship in the tomb of the patriarchs. All this says to me is that people really believe this book. While we yawn about it, people are dying for what they believe in this book. That's the uh, overview, but let's get to what I think the main subject is that I want to talk about. In this book, there are two types of people, two types of people that live during that time. And I believe there's two types of people, the same people in this congregation right now. So as I explain these two types of people, you have to decide which group are you a part of. There is going to be an RA and a PR. The R stands for residence on both of the names. The first one, an RA is a resident alien. We get that from verse 4. Look at verse 4. Abraham wants to bury his dead wife, and he says in verse 4, I am an alien and a stranger living among you. So he's an alien and stranger. That means I am not one of you. I'm from another area. I have loyalties to a different place. I actually have loyalty to God, but I'm settled among you. So he's saying I am both an alien, but I'm really part of you as well. I'm caught in this middle ground. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says, you are God's chosen people, aliens and strangers on the earth. You know how Jesus says it? He goes, Father, this is right before he died. He goes, Father, I pray for them because they are in this world, but they are not of this world. So you, if you truly are a Christian, and the Spirit of God has dwelt in your life, you are an alien. Face it. But you still look like a resident. You have the same styles, tastes, so you're caught in the middle. The other group here we call the permanent residents. The Hittites are a group of people that were pagan. They worship small g gods. But I say they're permanent because they are anchored to the soil. It's interesting. In the book of Revelations, chapter 6, when Jesus comes back, it says, The kings of the earth scream to the mountains. They say, Follow on us so we can hide from the fury of the Lamb. But that, the Greek word means they are people that are anchored, clawed to this ground, to the soil, as if all of their dreams, all of their identity, who they are, they find in their being on this earth. They, are find, they want all their hopes to be answered here. In their residence, they live here and they're going to die here. That's just who they are. When I went to high school, I went to this high school, that was a, uh, outside the city of Cleveland. It's called Bay Village. Bay Village High School, they did some studies. They said 93% of Bay Village graduates leave Bay Village and get a job in some other part of the country. And you sort of can feel it. When you go to Bay Village High School, people are rather transient. They aren't settled in. But it's completely different in Kent City. In Kent City, people often graduate, will stay here. And it's funny because I've been living here for a long time now and I still don't feel like I'm really a Kent Cityan. You know those names, there's big names that are the Kent Cityans. And they always will be the Kent Cityans. But, ah, yeah, okay, I'm glad to have you, but you're really not. You know what I'm talking about. I know I shouldn't say that, but you, that's being a resident alien. You're here, but you, I still feel like I just moved in. You're like, oh, hey, how long are you staying, son? Well, your kids all grew up here, but good to have you. One of those kind of things, one of those kind of deals. So, 
Which one are you? Are you an RA or are you a PR? Well, let's talk about it. It's because you'll live a certain way and you'll die a certain way. So let's first talk about, if you're an RA, how should you live? If you are a resident alien, how should you behave as you live in the land? And I got this little illustration because I think the ratio green to red, red is called remnant. Red is, there's a smaller group of RAs than PRs. Most people are PRs. So from Abraham's, Abraham's example, I believe there's two things, two ways you should live if you really are a resident alien. The first one is you need to be noble. You need to, you need to act, speak, and walk differently. You're God's ambassador. You're God's ambassador. Look at verse 4. So Abraham's wife died. He's asking for a plot. He said, sell me some property for burial. So he goes to the permanent residence and he said, I would, do you have a plot of land I could buy from you? Verse 5, the Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of tombs. So what's happening, there's some speculation they're trying to, um, they're trying to rip him off. But if you just read it at face value, here's what they're saying. Abraham, we know you. You aren't just a good man. There's a nobility to you. In fact, they probably heard the stories. Pharaoh scared of him. He took over. Do you remember there was a battle in Sodom and Gomorrah and he fought these kings and he, he won this huge battle with his men. He has a lot of flocks. And then this guy Abimelech, another king, wanted his wife. And he scared him. He made a peace deal. So you know there's rumors and reputation about this Abraham guy. And I think they're like, this guy's different. Royalty drips from him. When people see you, would they say you are a uh, person of royalty? You're an ambassador of the King of Heaven? 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 20 says you are an ambassador. That means you are a high-ranking official of heaven sent here to represent the kingdom of God. That's amazing. Philippians 3.20 says you, that's your citizenship. Go there a second. Philippians 3.20. That's in the New Testament. Right after Ephesians, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. And this is a descriptive term of believers. And it says, our citizenship, where we really belong, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like His glorious body. Meaning, right now, these bodies aren't glorious. We look like permanent residents, but deep down we're not. And someday we're going to put on royal garb. Our bodies are going to be changed. So if that's true, how should we live? Next chapter, verse 8. Look at verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything else is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. In reading that, I would, I would sum it all up saying, get your mind out of the gutter. And start being a noble person. Why do Christians feel like they should be just as filthy, just as rotten, and just as rude to fit in? Why do, why do Christians, I mean, you've probably heard me, why do they laugh at jokes that are just terrible? Like, just gross. Remember, I, my dad, growing up, my dad hated bathroom humor. You know, talking about, pooping and farting and all that stuff all the time. And he'd go, Chris, will you just stop talking about that because we are made for better than that. We're made for better than that. I was thinking even about this. When, let's say you're walking with Jesus for the three and a half years he's on earth. 
do you think Jesus was sarcastic? Like, do you think, let's say you messed up, do you think Jesus would turn and go, nice one, you idiot? Do you think Jesus talked like that? I mean, really, I, I, I wouldn't want to have anything to do. This is God. Oh, yeah, you're really smart, aren't you, you stupid? Then why do we talk like that all the time? It's like our normal conversation. We just want to rip people down. Why do we do that? Because we want to be on top. Act like you're noble. And then the second thing is I'd just say be respectful. And don't look for special favors because you're a Christian. If you go back to Abraham in, verse, in chapter 23, he is so respectful to the Hittites, he doesn't come up to them and say, you know what, someday this is going to be our land, you idiots, okay? So you better start treating me right. God's going to wipe you off the face of the earth. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Watch what he does in verse 4. He's kind. He's kind. He says, I'm an alien. Can you sell me some, some property? Verse 7, he's gracious. Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land. Verse 9, he's gracious. So he will sell the cave of Machpelah, which belongs to him. Ask him to sell it to me for full price. I'll, I'll buy it for full price. I don't need some Christian discount. You know? I'm part of, I want to settle in this land. I want to make honest contracts. I want to be an honest person. Verse 11. No, he calls Ephron a lord. He uses a title of respect. Verse 15. It's an excessive price. Like what's interesting is look at verse 14. Ephron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my lord. The land's worth 400 shekels of silver. But what's that between you and me? There is some speculation he's taking them for it, like he's, he's selling it at a high cost. This is the most expensive burial site in all of Scripture. To buy the potter's field for Jesus, it was only 30 pieces of silver. This is 400. But you know what? Abraham says, all right, I'll pay it. Verse 15, verse 15, 400 pieces, Abraham in 16 agreed to his terms, waited out for him, and he said it in all the Hittites so they couldn't, Say, that guy, that guy, Abraham, he was a cheap believer. Do people ever say, you're, a cheap, you're cheap because you're a Christian? I think Christians are always looking for deals. As a Christian, do I deserve special favor? Like, for instance, when, when people swear around you, do you go, just don't swear around me. Oh, it hurts my ears. Do you act shocked that non-Christians act like non-Christians? What's really interesting is, I like to use this illustration, imagine at Speedway a blind man drops his cane and walks into the window. And do you make fun of him? Look, that guy's walking in, what an idiot. No, he's blind. So is the non-Christian who sins. Have some compassion. So, another question I may be a stranger, but that doesn't mean I need to act strange. Christians act strange sometimes. What do I mean by that? Is it my job to hide while I wait for Jesus like an Amish guy, you know? Where, ooh, I, gotta, I can't be in this world at all, so i got to kind of hide. And I, we got to hold on until Jesus gets here. Are my kids fragile or are they infragile? As, reading this book that says human beings are made infragile. Let me give you an illustration. A match is fragile. A bonfire is infragile. A match, if I just blow on it, it goes out. Poof. Or a match goes... Whoosh. A bonfire, if I blow on it, it gets bigger. We need to start raising kids that are... They get stronger with conflict. They get better with difficulty instead of, we can't let them hear. The humanistic teaching is going to kill them. <laughs> Will it? Teach them. They'll be stronger for it. Let them stand strong. We need smart Christians. We need good lawyers that are Christians. We need good scientists that are Christians. Don't hide. Should my kids work hard or wait for Christ to rescue them from calluses on their hands? Oh, life's hard. Didn't work. 
Final question, if I'm an RA, how then shall I live while I'm in exile? In the book of Jeremiah, it's very interesting. They were taken, these Jewish people were taken from Israel and they brought to Babylon, very pagan. And this prophet, Hananiah, said, you know what, God's going to rescue you right away. And Jeremiah said, don't listen to him, Hananiah is telling lies. You're going to be here a long time. And while you're in exile, how should you live? And so he writes them this letter. It's in Jeremiah 29, verse 4. And he said, here's how you should live while you're waiting for God to come. Because you might be there a while. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give their daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease also. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so he's saying two things. First of all, while you're here, enjoy life. Don't despise it while you wait. There's a lot of Christians that are explain it like this. I, when I was a kid, I used to watch um, UHF TV. In Cleveland, on Saturdays, they had really bad movies on. I loved to watch bad, cheesy movies. That's just how I was. I know, you think I'm weird. So at noon, I'd, I'd get a bowl of spaghetti on meatballs and watch a bad movie. And one movie that was on, it was a really weird movie. It was about these people, and they were dressed in burlap sacks, and they had, you know, really their hair was like they were kind of Amish, and they walked around like this. They, they could only look at the ground. And they walked around like this. Everywhere they went, they walked around like this. And one family had gave birth to this girl, this little girl. She's a lot like Nora Doty. Have you ever watched Nora Doty in the first service? You know, she dances. And so this girl, they got this girl that's dancing like that. And they're like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? So they bought these really heavy lead shoes and they tied it on her. So she learned to walk like that too. And so everybody's walking around, everybody's sad, and they're all walking around like that. And then when she turned 13, she un unlaced the shoes and went walking in the backyard and started doing that dancing again. And she took a jump, and all of a sudden she started flying in the air. And she's flying. I know, it's a, weird, it's a weird show. But she started teaching other people they can fly too. And the point is, a lot of Christians, we, are, we always have rules, and we can't do this we got to wait for Jesus and just hang on and hold our breath because it stinks here. Will you enjoy it a little bit? God made it for you too. Why don't you glorify God in your body with joy and life and adventure? I mean, in a way, when Ace is going to Papua New Guinea, man, he's going to see things that He's going to fly airplanes over these mountains that are like rainforests. He's going to get to eat big fruit and wrestle with snakes that might kill him. It'll be great! <laughs> and then the second thing that says is pray. Pray for peace. Care, do you care about the people that live around you? Well, they're PR. Those people are mean. I'm, I just pray for Christians. Why? This saying, if it goes well for them, it's going to go good for you too. Like there's this, there's this I, I thank God I have friends that truthfully help me be a little more balanced politically and sometimes they say, do we care for the poor? Do we? I think we should. Do you care that there's sometimes abuse going on at the border? Well, how dare you? We need, I know we need protection, but we also should care. Like for instance, sometimes... Some people, as a pastor, will say, no, I don't go to your church, and I don't necessarily believe in God, but somebody I love died. Could we use your facility for a funeral? No way. This is only for Christians. No, we, we help them. We help. So, that's how we should live as an RA. We should be noble, and we should be respectful. So how should we die? Because I would say the way to tell you're an RA or PR isn't as much by how you live, it's how you die. How should we die? Well, look in Genesis 23, verse 1. Here's the first thing Abraham does. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. That's a long time. I mean, 
Imagine if you and you are Abraham and you're thinking through. I remember when Sarah and I left the land, man, she was with me the whole way. I still can't believe she stayed married to me after I gave her to Pharaoh. Oh, what a lady. I remember when she laughed. What a day that was when the angel of God came by and heard, us, heard her laughing. So remember when she gave birth to Isaac. That was amazing. So imagine all of those thoughts Abraham had, and then she dies. She dies. She dies in the land of Canaan. And it says, Abraham then went to mourn for her, and he wept over her. He grieved. Grieving is both good and it's proper. It means, you, um, means you're human. It means that you're hurt. And it's okay to admit that because, because according to the Bible, death was never intended. Death means separation. It's separation from your soul with your body. It's also separation from the people you love. It's never intended. And it's also proper to grieve because when Jesus saw his best friend die, Lazarus says he wept. So as he wept, we live sometimes in this, uh, you know what? The sting of death is, where oh, death is your victory. And you say it like that, where oh, death is your sting. It's, it's right there. The sting is still, he killed the person I love. Do you know that verse? It's in 1 Corinthians 15. And it says, where oh, death is your victory. Where oh, death is your sting. And it, and it comes right after, comes right after we are given new bodies. That's when we're going to say that. But right now, in these bodies of clay, death still stings. Remember my professor in seminary said, when you counsel with somebody in the hospital and they just lost somebody, do not say they're going to be in a better place. And any emotion is just fine. But, but, here's where... Here's where the RA really differs. In death, we need to find our hope in the resurrection, not in the medicine. Is it my goal to keep someone alive at all costs? Even if they're, they can't think, even if they are, um, they're mentally not there. Is it my goal just to keep them alive at all costs. Is the miracle that they're still breathing or is the miracle that they are going to be raised from the dead? We have lost that resurrection is our hope. Not that they're still got monitors keeping them alive. It's weird. We have turned people into patients as if that's their prime thing so we can do experiments on them with new medicines. and We're eternal beings. Here to live forever. And sometimes let people go. It's the best thing for them and you. A lot of people feel guilty. Like, oh, they shouldn't have died. Who doesn't die that ever lives? You want to know where our hope is? Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. When it comes to death, here's our hope. And you'll see how it's written. First, Corinthians, or First Thessalonians. Thessalonians is after Timothy. First and Second Timothy. Actually, it's after Colossians. Before Timothy. I did that to see if you're listening. So First Thessalonians 4. And look at verse 13 to the end. And I've got it up here. This is a timeline of hope. So it begins, it says, we do not want you to grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. So it says, we do not want you, R.A., to grieve like all the PRs. The rest of mankind is another phrase for those who find their hope in this soil down here. And when death happens, did you know you're not going to have all your dreams come true down here? They just won't. And if you think they are and death happens... You're shattered. You're shattered. So listen to what happens. The first thing that we believe is that God will bring with Jesus 
those who have fallen asleep. So the first thing is we believe Jesus is coming back again. There's a lot of different scenarios on how he's going to come back, but all Christians, true believers, believe in what's called the second coming. He's going to come back. He is going to come back. Second thing it says, in that it says, and we who are still alive, who are left unto the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord Jesus will come down from heaven, so he himself will come, so we will see him. I believe the whole world will see him when he comes back again. It will be a physical coming. We'll see him. This isn't some false, you know, like mystical thing that the Lord Jesus will come. And then it says he's going to come with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who have died in our RAs, those who are Christians who have died, their body at the time of death goes to the ground, but their soul and spirit go to be with Jesus, and they're given a spiritual body. Jesus is going to come with those who are alive with him today. And then it says after that, we who are still alive and are left, We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll be with him forever. So that means those who are then alive, after Jesus comes down, and their soul gets a new body, so you're going to see the spirits rising, it's going to meet, and then we're going to all of a sudden, in the change of an eye, these bodies will put on a new royal garb with our spirit, and we're going to all be with Christ. He's going to take us so he can do some business down here, and when he does business down here, and cleans it up after about seven years, then we're going to come back down. So imagine I'm walking to Myers. And let's just say there's a uh, cemetery right by the Myers I'm walking to, so I'm walking to Myers like this. All of a sudden I hear oh, some trumpet. <laughs> so what's that? I look up the sky's part, and there he is, and coming with him as I see my dad right there with him. That's my dad. What is my... And all of a sudden, I'll see this body and soul merge together. Wow. And I think right before I get out the W on my wow, shazam, I'm changed. Boom. All of a sudden, I start rising. What is going on? Remember, I'm not shuffling like this anymore. That's my hope. Some of you might say you are certifiably nuts. I am. That's what faith is. Faith walks the razor's edge of sanity. This is nuts. But I believe with everything I have in it, in me. Some of you believe more in Endgame, Avengers, than you would the Scriptures. And I feel bad for you because you're nuts. It's, it's a cartoon. It's a cartoon with a lot of CGI. Just get over it. Get over it. But it was so incredible. What was incredible? Don't change your life. This is incredible. Because someday... I'm going to see my dad again. I don't know about you. You're going to see the person you love the most again. Amen. Amen. Say it. It's all right. You are, people are, are going to condemn you later. Don't ever do that again. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. We, are so, we get so nervous, don't we? So you know what you need to do, Christiana? Go home and start shuffling like that. Get back into order again. Get back. How do you know you do a good job as an RA? Go to the book of Hebrews. How do you know, if you are an RA, how do you know if you've been successful? And I want you to go to Hebrews 11. That baby is ready for the second coming. <laughs> and the mom is dying. Oh no! <laughs> you need to shuffle when you go home too. Teach your baby to shuffle. Things will get better. Hebrews 11. And I want you to look at verse 9 and 13 to 16. Actually, it's 9 and 10. Now, this passage, the, I would like to, I would say this is the antidote for bad Christian teaching. The bad Christian teaching these days is called the health and prosperity gospel. This is the antidote against the health and prosperity gospel. This is the antidote to bad American Christianity. And this is the antidote to help you know if you really are wanting what's right. So look at starting in verse 9 of Hebrews 11. By faith, 
he, meaning Abraham, made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. That's what we just said. And then it says he lived in tents. So the idea is that he kind of had a backpack on and he would move from town to town. He'd set up a tent for a while and he'd stay there as long as God wanted him to and then he'd pack up. He didn't hold tight to the land. He was open to what God would do with his life. So if he wanted to go to Papua New Guinea, sure. He wasn't anchored to the land. That's the intent. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, his two sons, well, his son and grandson, who were heirs with him of the same promise. So they were hoping for the promised land to come true, but they were willing to wait and hang out in tents. Why? Verse 10. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations. That means rock, solid stone. Compare it to a flimsy tent, foundations as pillars and stone and cornerstone. And whose architect and builder is God. So this is not going to be a city made by us. It's going to be a city made by God himself. Now look at verse 13. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. So all of these people are the people in chapter 11. The faith heroes is what we call them. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. What does that mean? That means they didn't find all of their dreams to come true on earth. They didn't come true. They didn't get everything they wanted. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted, they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Why isn't this, here's a question, why isn't this heaven yet? Because you can't have sin in heaven, so you need to deal with it now, and sin has corrupted everything, and it's not the way it should be. So when some of you are like, why doesn't God come down and give us heaven? Because he's got to deal with sin. And if he just came back, those who still are lost in sin would never get to taste heaven. That's why. Keep reading. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Now watch this. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking the country they had left, they would have opportunity to return, meaning they can go claw back at the soil if they want. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. They're saying, that's what I want. I'm willing to wait for that. And if you're willing to wait for that, watch what your reward is. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Are you a success? You want to know how you're a success? That God's not ashamed of you. That's amazing to me. In, the New, in the Matthew it says, if you shout that you are God's follower from the mountaintops, he's going to shout your name. But if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. It kind of reminds me when I was, I can remember times in my life when my dad would be talking to his buddies and I'd be walking by, and he'd say, Chris, come here, come here. I'm like, what do you want, Dad? He goes, just come here. And I'd come up to my dad, he'd put his arm around me, and he'd say to his friends, he goes, this is my son. I love this guy. That's what that means. When you live a good life down here as an RA, God will say, come here, come here. I'm going to tell all the angels about you. This is my daughter, this is my son. That's how you know if you're a success. I was, uh, I've got a, I've got a niece who's going to get married this summer, and her her husband signed up for Survivor, that TV show, and he got selected to be on Survivor. So we've been watching Survivor, I've never really watched it. And, it, you know, it's all these 20 people are on an island, and they got 39 days, and whoever wins gets a million dollars. And you watch it, and they're eating, they're eating like snails and octopus and rice, a lot of rice, a lot of rice. And you're wondering, why would they do that? Why, you know, they get really scruffy, their hair, they can't wash it, they're, they're just kind of regular, ugly people, Really? Why would they do that? Why would they be willing to be exposed like that? Why? For a million dollars. Why would anybody be willing daily to deny themselves, give up themselves, and follow Christ for uh, having God not ashamed of me? 
it's worth it. If you're an RA, it's worth it. If you're a PR, everything I've said to you, something wrong with that guy. <laughs> something wrong with that guy. I'm looking for a Lamborghini. <laughs>